to you, Joy. Okay. Do you want me to speak from here? How does this work? Yeah, I mean, you can either stand up or... Uh, can everyone hear me sitting down? So I think you could probably s remain seated if you prefer that. Okay. Um, this work is drawn from a book I published a few months ago called Invisible War, the United States and the Iraq Sanctions with Harvard University Press. And what I'd like to talk about today is the role of the United States in the damage that was done by the UN sanctions on Iraq from 1990 to 2003. While the UK was in many regards in lockstep with the US, in some respects the US had no support from anyone, not even Britain. I believe it's critical to understand the process within the UN Security Council in which the damage was done and from which, to this day, Iraq has not recovered. Starting in August 1990, the United States was instrumental in imposing the cruelest sanctions in the history of international governance. While the UN Security Council was mandated to respond to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, the sanctions regime it imposed in conjunction with the massive bombing campaign of 1991 destroyed nearly all of Iraq's infrastructure, industrial capacity, agriculture, telecommunications, and critical public services, particularly electricity and water treatment. For the next 12 years, the sanctions would prevent Iraq from restoring any of these to the level it had achieved in the 1980s and would devastate the health, education, and basic well-being of almost the entire Iraqi population. The situation was worsened by the corruption in the Iraqi government, and the Iraqi government was not particularly effective at mitigating the harm done by the UN measures but it was the extraordinary harshness of the sanctions coming on top of the 1991 bombing that was primarily responsible for the collapse of Iraq's economy. It was the consistent policy of all three U.S. administrations from 1990 to 2003 to inflict the most extreme economic damage possible on Iraq. This was true even though each administration insisted that it was committed to the well-being of the Iraqi people. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright once said, I care more about the children of Iraq than Saddam Hussein does. But the truth was that in implementing the policy on sanctions, the human damage was never a factor in the U.S. policy. The overwhelming concern of the U.S. government through strategies that were overly broad in the extreme was to prevent Iraq from rebuilding its military. The first strategy was simply to bankrupt the nation as a whole. The second was disarmament, which included a prohibition on dual-use goods, interpreted in the broadest possible sense. Invoking dual-use, the United States unilaterally locked child vaccines, water tankers during a period of drought, cloth, the generator needed to run a sewage treatment plant, radios for ambulances, any goods that could even conceivably be used by the military for any possible purpose. The problem, of course, is that there is precious little that is used by a civilian population that is not also used by the military. Window glass, brake fluid, telephones, light switches. The list is absolutely without end. Regardless of the US government's public posturing, the officials who formulated and implemented the policy literally gave no weight to the humanitarian cost of their actions. Quote, it was not part of our skill set one State Department said, one State Department official said. Prior to the Persian Gulf War of 1991, the Iraqi government had invested heavily in social and economic development. Iraq had made impressive strides in health, education, and infrastructure. In 1980, the Iraqi government initiated a program to increase the survival rates of infants and young children. The result was a rapid and steady decline in childhood mortality. Prior to the Gulf War, there was good vaccination coverage. The majority of women were attended by trained health professionals during childbirth. The majority of the adult population was literate, and there was nearly universal access to primary school education. The vast majority of households had access to safe water and to electricity. Iraq won an award from UNESCO for its campaign to eliminate illiteracy among women. In 1988, the Food and Agriculture Organization found that undernourishment was no longer a public health problem. In fact, 7% of Iraqi children were obese. Prior to the embargo, 93% of primary school age children attended school. Prior to the embargo, over 90% of the population had access to health care, and it was a highly sophisticated health care system. The majority of Iraqi physicians 
were trained in Europe or the United States, and one quarter were board certified. But the massive bombing campaign of the 1991 Gulf War changed all of that. It systematically targeted all of Iraq's infrastructure. In 1991, an envoy of the UN Secretary General described in some detail the collapse that resulted from the bombing, including water purification and sewage treatment, agricultural production and food supplies and distribution, the destruction of the telephone system, and all modern means of communication. He identified the particular urgency of energy needs. Without the production of electricity, he noted, food that is imported cannot be preserved and distributed, water cannot be purified, sewage cannot be pumped away and cleansed, crops cannot be irrigated, medicines cannot be conveyed where they are needed. <coughs> Among other things, this resulted in epidemics of cholera and typhoid. In 1990, the incidence of typhoid was 11 per 100,000 people. By 1994, it was 142 per 100,000 people. In 1989, there were zero cases of cholera per 100,000 people. By 1994, there were 1,344 cases of cholera per 100,000 people. With the sanctions in place, these epidemics then became permanent. The collapse of infrastructure meant that medical equipment could no longer function for lack of electricity. Food could not be distributed because roads and bridges were destroyed. The water was not fit for human consumption because sewage treatment plants had been destroyed. All of this was reflected in the excess mortality rate of children under the age of five. That is, the number of young children who died during sanctions who would not have died without them. Although the data available from Iraq have not always been reliable, and this figure has been the subject of much debate, the majority of the studies over the course of the sanctions regime suggest that for the period from 1990 to 2003, that figure is at least 500,000. 500,000 children under five dead as a result of the sanctions, plus an uncountable number of persons over the age of five, including the elderly and the ill. As the humanitarian impact of sanctions became more visible in the 1990s, a number of political scientists and ethicists proposed criteria for their ethical use, including humanitarian exemptions to protect the most vulnerable members of the population. They argued that there must be some provision to allow in humanitarian goods. These exemptions were ostensibly provided when the 661 Committee, the Committee of the Security Council charged with overseeing the sanctions, took on the task of reviewing requests for humanitarian imports. But while this protection existed in principle, it was compromised in many ways, mainly by holds. Any member of the Security Council could veto any item for any reason and put it on hold. The holds were a stark illustration of the level of detail and the degree of effort that went into crippling Iraq one item at a time. They make evident how deliberate and consistent the U.S. practices were. It required constant attention and political maneuvering on a daily or weekly basis regarding each item and request, of which there were thousands annually, in order to deny each in turn in the face of constant and vocal skepticism. The use of holds also speaks to one of the fundamental issues uh, for any measures imposed by the UN. When there is a conflict between the commitment, the UN's commitment to humanitarian principles and its commitment to security, which one trumps? The UN Charter simply doesn't tell us. In the case of the holds, the answer was that any security risk, however speculative or slight, was given absolute credence and overrode any humanitarian concern, however extensive and certain. On one occasion, the United States blocked cloth as an input to industry. The reasoning was, cloth is an input to industry. If Iraq is allowed to rebuild its industrial capacity, it could then rebuild its military capacity. On this reasoning, the United States blocked materials to make shoes, glue for manufacturing cigarettes, sewing thread, materials to produce plastic bottles for juice, raw cotton for the production of medical gauze, all on the grounds that they supported Iraq 